Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel. I'm Pastor Eric Kennall. Let me pull that out of my mask. That's better. <laughs> what a wonderful day to be here as the weather is warming. Uh, this is the time of year where hope begins to spring, uh, the snow begins to melt, uh, and we get a chance to start to be out more, which is an interesting time to be having our conversation in the Red Letter Challenge as we get to our first target today, the target of being and we're going to talk about the difference between being and doing. And there's a really important distinction uh, that needs to be made uh, between those two things. Uh, and we need to learn how to better be with God and in his presence rather than always trying to do things for him. So be listening for that throughout the service. And we'll talk more about that at the message time. I invite you to stand as we join in our opening hymn, God Whose Love in Humble Servants. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our confession is responsive from words of the Old Testament and the New. God established an everlasting covenant with Abraham, but our faith has waxed and waned. O oh Lord, forgive our forgetfulness of your unchanging grace. David wrote, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord but we have failed to remember one another of God's mercy and love. 
forgive our hesitancy to share the news of your gracious presence. Paul wrote that because Christ died for the ungodly, we are justified by his blood, but we have tried to hide our sinfulness. Lord, forgive our blindness to your very sacrifice of our Savior. God sent his Son into the world with one purpose, to save us from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, how much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. We join in our song of response. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who sent your Son into the flesh so that he might pay for our sins and open eternal life to us, grant us strong faith so that we may purposefully take up our crosses and follow where he has led the way. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading. The Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord.
The epistle lesson is from the second chapter of Philippians. Therefore, my beloved, as you, as, always, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even as I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. If anyone would deny himself, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. <clears throat> Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? <clears throat> Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man." And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, <clears throat> maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Boys and girls, I'd like to take a moment with you all right now. <coughs> As we're talking about our red letter challenge and the words of Jesus today, uh, we have words uh, that encourage us to put, again, Jesus' words into practice. Uh, Jesus says that uh, if we're ashamed of his words, uh, then he will too be ashamed of us. That's kind of a scary thing for Jesus to say. But let me ask you, how many of you are involved in some kind of extracurricular thing? You play a, a sport normally, maybe not with COVID right now. Do you play a musical instrument? You dance? Anybody? Gymnastics? Yeah, there's lots of different things that you can be doing. So let me ask you, what's more fun, to play the game or to go to practice? Practice is more fun? Those crazy Larson kids. All right. <laughs> How many of you like to play the games? I love to play the games. I love to play anything. I love to compete, to be on the court, to be on the floor, uh, to do uh, what it is that we love to do. So let me ask you, maybe if it's dancing, you love the recital, right? When the crowd is all there and the lights are on and the music is going, why don't you just sign up for the recital? Why don't you just sign up for the games, right? You just go to the league office and say, look, I'm just signing up for the Saturday games. I don't want to do any of the practices because they're not any fun. What do you think would happen? Do you think your team would be very good? Do you think when the music started, you'd know what to do when it was time to start dancing? Nope, you'd just start doing the Macarena, right? Because that's all you knew what to do. Practice is actually really important because it prepares us for the game. You have to go to rehearsals. You have to practice your instrument. You have to practice with your team. Because when you don't practice, you might be really good on your own, but you won't know how to work with others. You won't know what the game plan is. You won't have seen the music before or know what the moves are. Well, our Christian faith is often a lot the same. We love when God sends us the big moments to do something. Somebody gets sick and we can just swoop in and love on them. Someone's hurting and we can just join them. There's a mission trip and we can sign up and we can build someone a house. We love the game. We love to get in when there's something big to do. You know what we struggle with? Reading our Bible every day. Praying every day. Spending time with God we all know, and you know you should do that, right? You know you should be reading your Bible. We know we should be praying. <clears throat> and yet, we'd rather go on a mission trip. We'd rather go to feed my starving children. We'd rather serve somebody. But the truth is that just like in sports or in music or in dance, <clears throat> we have an incredible coach. And when you have an incredible coach and you have time to practice, you get better. 
You get better at your sport, you get better on your team, and you can do greater things. You can make better music, you can have awesome recitals, because your teacher, your instructor, or your coach knows what they're doing and can show you in practice how to do it better. Well, when we open our Bibles, we get together with the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, comes and begins to coach us, to teach us what it means to follow Jesus, to hear his words, and to have it come into our hearts so that when someone's hurting, we actually know how to love them. When it's time to serve, we actually know how to serve them in a way that gives God the glory rather than saying, I'm awesome because I helped you. So we need, as we're thinking about who we are in Jesus, we need to remember that every day is a day that we learn and grow with Jesus. Every day is a day where the Holy Spirit comes as we pray, as we read our Bible, as we come to worship, to coach us up, to train us for the big moments, for the game, for when the spotlight is on and it's our turn to take the stage. If you're unprepared when the spotlight comes on, that's a scary feeling. But if we listen to Jesus' words and we let him help us to practice them, then in those moments at the recital in the game, it's going to be awesome because we'll know what to do. We'll know all the moves. We'll know all the music. We'll know how the plays are run. <clears throat> and it'll be so much fun. But you have to put in the practice. You have to do the groundwork, it's called, so that in the moment you're ready. So, when next time you have your Bible in front of you, you're thinking, oh, but I could go play, I could go watch Peppa Pig again, I could do something else, <clears throat> maybe that's a day to open your Bible and ask your mom or dad to come and help you, because the Holy Spirit will come and coach you together, and it'll be awesome. Let's pray. I'm going to say part of a prayer, and you say it up to God. Say, dear Holy Spirit, dear Holy Spirit, thank you, thank you for being in my life for being in my life. Help me, help me to learn from you, to learn from you every day. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. We join in our message song.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we started last week with kind of our introduction to the Red Letter Challenge, uh, we came to the realization that a big part of the problem that we have being the church is that there's so many things that we can do. The Bible is filled with so many <clears throat> commands and opportunities and laws that it's easy to try and fulfill all of them and essentially get ourselves spread spiritually so thin that we don't end up accomplishing much. And so we talked last time about our need to clarify the targets that we're shooting for, to keep the main things, the main things in our faith. Because I think what the world often sees is the moments when we're distracted, the moments when we're not quite being what God would have us to be for him. And they miss the main things as well. So those five main targets were being what it is to be a child of God, forgiving, Jesus talks all the time about forgiving, serving, giving, and going. Those are the five big things that Jesus talked about. And we're spending Lent looking at the words of Jesus, the things that he said, and having those to shape us over these 40 days. 40 days is an important biblical number uh, because 40, we see it all over the place. If you've been through uh, the Bible study for this first week yet, um, we see it 40 days in the wilderness, right? Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness. They wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, there's 40s all over the place. But 40 was also a number in Jewish culture because of the way that 40s came through their history that marked a sign of maturity. A fetus was considered a viable person after 40 days. It was mature enough now to be considered a person. Um, in their culture, you couldn't really own a business and be a master at anything until you were 40 years old. So they were shocked when Jesus, as a 30-year-old, is teaching in ways that mature adults don't even teach, and he has not yet reached full maturity. So we're going to spend these 40 days in Lent hoping to grow in the words of Jesus to fuller maturity. So today we're talking about being. God has called us to be with him. We know and even cherish some of those verses, right? Be still and know that I'm God. God desires us to just be with him. In our Old Testament lesson, there was an amazing example of that. As God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, humble yourself before me and I will give my covenant to you. Abraham, be my guy and I will make a covenant with you. And Abraham bows down. And God promises to make him into a great nation, to make his wife now fruitful and to bring forth a son and from the son a nation. God didn't say, Abraham, if you defeat my enemies and you go and accomplish this great task, and you climb this high mountain, then I'll know you're worthy. No, nope, he just said, humble yourself. Be holy before me. Abraham, just be my guy, and I will be your God and give you all the blessings that come with it. The reality is that we were made for relationship. When God was sitting in eternity past, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this wonderful, perfect relationship of love and peace and unity and wholeness and joy. He didn't look around all uh, that didn't exist yet and say, we need to create some things because we need to get some stuff done. What we really need is to create a universe in which we can put people in it so they can get stuff done for us and we won't have to do the work. So let's create people and give them jobs and responsibilities so that they can build a kingdom and make a holy city and build a temple and do the sacrifices because this stuff needs to get done. God didn't say that. The indications we get from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 is that God looked around all that could be and said, you know, the only thing that would make this better than the perfect relationship we have is if we had someone to share it with. If someone else could experience love and joy and unity and peace the way that we do, that would make the world better. 
That's why when God creates Abraham, and there's no sin, there's no wickedness, there's no evil, there's nothing bad in the universe, and yet God looks at Abraham and says, it's not good that he's alone. Everything I made is perfect, and yet this isn't good. Why? Because Adam was made to have a relationship in the image of God, a relationship like God does. Someone of the same essence as he is, someone of the same stuff that he is, like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all the same stuff. I need to make Adam a companion who's just like him, made of the same stuff. And so he takes part of Adam. He doesn't pile up more dirt. He takes part of Adam, and from that makes Eve. And now he says it's not only good, it is very good. It's as good as it can be. Because Adam not only has a perfect relationship with me, but a perfect relationship with someone like him. This is what we were made for. What's interesting is in the garden, there was work to do. They had to tend the garden. They had to care for creation. But the work was an extension of their relationship. They did the work together. The work was a joy. The work expanded their love and their care for each other. It wasn't something that came between them. Adam didn't go to the office and spend hours away from Eve. They worked in the garden together. And it actually built their relationship because they had things to do. But the work came second. The work was secondary. The relationship was the main thing. And everything that they did was an extension of and built on that relationship. And then they shared it with God as they walked in the garden together, as they talked with God, as they had peace with God, as they watched the sunset in his presence. And that's what God always wanted. So isn't it interesting that when sin comes into the picture, when Adam and Eve rebel against God and sin begins to warp everything, that one of the things that happens is that we get out of order why it is that we're here. And work becomes primary, and relationships become secondary. Suddenly, it's more important that we get the work done. It's more important that we check off the list. It's more important that we have a title and a responsibility, and we make our mark in the world. I mean, this is especially present in men's lives, right? If you ask a man who he is, he will tell you what he does. Because I can't define myself apart from being a pastor or whatever your job is. And when I want to know about you as a man, I'm genuinely interested in what you do because it will tell me who you are. That's not the way it's supposed to be. In the beginning, if you were to ask Adam who he was, he would tell you, I am a child of God, his glorious creation in a wonderful relationship with him. Oh yeah, and I take care of the garden too. If you asked Adam after the fall, he would say, I am responsible and the master of all of creation here to tend it and to care for it. And oh yeah, I have a relationship with God too that's pretty cool. It got completely out of order and it stayed that way. We now are a people who have an accomplishment addiction. We love to get stuff done. We love to have checklists. We love to have days where we're cranking out the work because we feel fulfilled. We feel important. We feel satisfied generally at the end of those days when we got a whole bunch of stuff done. They're also generally the days when we didn't interact with other people. When we were so busy at our task list that other people went by and we didn't even notice them, or we canceled meetings, or we didn't have time for them, because relationships are secondary. I'm important when I get my stuff done. We are a people who are all about doing, addicted to accomplishment, to make our mark in the world, to put our nose to the grindstone, and relationships are secondary. Right? There are lots of people who work 50, 60, 70 hours a week, and twice a year they take a week away to have a vacation with their family. That's great that they take a vacation with their family, but that's actually backwards. They should be spending more time with their family than they are at work. Their relationships should be more important than what it is that they do. And when you get to the end of your life, you realize 
and, and I mean, we, you talk about this in culture, we realize that nobody celebrates how much money you made. No one celebrates how many hours that you put in. No one will talk about what widgets you made. No, they'll talk about what kind of father you were what kind of mother you were, how you cared for other people, how you committed yourself to God and the things that were important. But the reality is, while we talk about those things, because ultimately they're important in our lives, they were secondary. We don't want to be those people anymore because that's not what Jesus did. When you think of the life of Jesus... Jesus didn't define himself by what he did. Other people talked about him as the healer or the teacher or the rabbi. But anytime Jesus talked about himself, he could only talk about himself in relationship to the Father. He is constantly saying, my heavenly Father, my Father in heaven. I am the Son of the Father. And it offended people that he would define himself that way because they defined themselves as rabbi, as Pharisee, as Levite. What they did, what their political and religious affiliations were. And Jesus kept going back to that original thing with Adam and saying, no, no, I'm, I'm the Son of the Father. I do lots of stuff, but this is who I am. And it confounded and offended them that he would say that. But Jesus didn't actually come up with to-do lists for every day. Jesus lived very peacefully and almost passively at times. When Jesus wanted to know what to do, he would talk to the Father. His days seem to be filled, even though they only mention it in a couple of places, but he seems to have regularly slipped off to go and pray so he wouldn't be bothered by anyone else. It was his custom, Mark tells us, that on the Sabbath he was in the synagogue, and on one day they gave him the scroll of Isaiah and asked him to teach them. He was in worship. He was in God's word. He was in prayer regularly. And when he came to the city of Jericho, he wasn't worried about <coughs> excuse me, anyone else's expectations of his time. Right In the story of Zacchaeus, there's this parade in Jericho, and they're going through the streets, and everyone's cheering, and they're lined up three or four deep like Macy's. And Jesus is looking around wondering what his father is up to. He doesn't have his own agenda. He's learned that his life only has value when it's interacting with the Father. And the things that he does in the world only have transcendent value when they're what God is doing. And he joins them. So this parade's prob <clears throat> probably leading to the mayor's office where he's going to get the key to the city and be really important and lifted up. And instead he sees this short guy who's climbed up a tree where short guys aren't supposed to be, where grown men aren't supposed to be. And Jesus says, aha, here's where my father's at work, not, not at the mayor's office. He stops the whole parade, says, Zacchaeus, come down here. Let's go to your house and talk. And Zacchaeus hears about the love of God and his life is transformed. None of us would have stopped a parade in our honor to talk to the guy in town everybody hated. But Jesus did, because that's where his father was at work, and if he wanted to be in relationship with his father, then he had to be doing the things his father was doing. You know that growing up, if you wanted to spend time with dad, if you weren't fishing, you had to join him in what he was doing. So you had to help him with the woodwork. You had to hold the tools while he was fixing the car. You had to do stuff with dad because that's how you had a relationship together. The work is an extension of the relationship. And that's what Jesus saw in his heavenly father. Because he was focused on simply being his son and doing whatever it was that he saw his father do. And over and over again in his ministry, he says, look, I only do what I see my father doing. I only do what I see the father doing. That's it. That's my whole agenda. Look around and say, what is the Father doing? That's not at all how we function, is it? In our forming class that I'm going through, it's, it's a fantastic class in our relational series. 
Uh, the, the textbook talks a whole lot about the difference between rowing and sailing. And that's really the difference between doing and being. <laughs> so when you're rowing, you sit down, right? You take the oars and you begin to work. You stick them in the water and you pull with all your might and you go again. And your posture is that your head is down, you're focused on yourself, on maximizing your energy and your strength. You're completely oblivious to the world around you. You've got a goal behind you that you can't actually see that you're shooting for, and every once in a while, you'll look up to see if you're still on target, but your focus is down, and all of your energy and all of your effort is in yourself until you're exhausted. Then you stop and catch your breath, and you start over again, but you find that you can't go quite as far as you did the first time, and you repeat this cycle until you burn out, head down, focused on yourself, doing everything in your own strength and your own effort. If you've ever been sailing, you know that's a completely different experience. In sailing, it's not your power that drives the ship, it's the wind. Your posture in sailing is always focused up. It's always focused up because that's where the wind is. And if the wind is going to drive your boat, then you have to pay attention to it. So rather than head down, muscles working, straining, your eyes are up and you're attentive to the subtlest shifts in the wind because you've got to trim the sails. When the, when the wind shifts, you need to adjust the boat so that it keeps going. And you have, to, you have to pay attention. You have to feel the movements. You have to know what's going on above you. Whether the wind is dying and you need to put out a jib or it's, it's luffing and you've got to put out the giant spinnaker so that you can maximize that forward progress. But sailing's fun because it's not hard work. You can sail all day for days on end because all you're doing is making micro adjustments, paying attention to what's happening above you. That's the way the Christian life is supposed to be lived. So often, we're focused on doing for God, on accomplishing things for Him that we think will bring Him glory because we know somewhere He said we should do something like that, and we put our heads down, and we plow through until we're exhausted. <clears throat> God says, no, a relationship with me should be like sitting in a sailboat with the breath of the Holy Spirit filling your sails and driving you in the direction that I want to go. And your job is to learn to sense the movement of the wind, to know when it's time to tack and to go in a different direction in order to maximize the wind's effectiveness. When to trim the sails, when to let them out. And it's easy. It's fun. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> And we have a hard time with that because words like yoke and burden don't associate themselves with words like easy and light. But this is what Jesus is talking about. When you're with him, your job is to have your eyes up, watching where the Spirit is moving and reacting to his movement. Not straining, not stressed, not sweating, not driving, but up and attentive and enjoying the ride. The journey with God should be fun, should be filled with the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness that we talk about, that we talked last week about the fact that the world is looking for it. And because our heads are down and we're trying to plow through all the to-dos we think we have for God, we're missing it. We're stressed out and exhausted. So how in the world do we learn to lift our eyes up? How do we let go of the oars and open up the sails so that the Spirit can, can flow? And the reality is that's what the spiritual gift, or the spiritual gifts, spiritual disciplines are there for. That's what you learn to do when you open your Bible and you read the words of Jesus and you begin to learn his heart and his passion and the things that he thought and cared about. You become much more sensitive to them in the world around you. 
You begin to see needs where you didn't see them before, like the gentle shifting of the wind, and you know how to react and respond because your head is up and your eyes are looking. When you, you learn to pray and to hear how God prompts you in prayer, not an audible voice that says, do this or go here, but rather those nudges of the Spirit. We learn to follow and join him in his work like Jesus did. But there's other kinds of spiritual gifts. And this is where I think people get confused, and, and even our author this week doesn't make this distinction as clearly as I'd like. Because some, there are other spiritual gifts that don't actually teach us to sense the wind and the spirit. Gifts like fasting, or spiritual disciplines like fasting, or solitude, or simplicity, or Sabbath. These are the things that allow us to lift our eyes up. These are the things that allow us to be free, to sense the movement of the Spirit, and to learn to hear God's promptings in our lives. They're not the things that actually feel them. Because when you're in a sailboat, you're also looking around at the waves that are being created. You're watching the birds as they fly by. You're checking out other boats, and it's easy to lose track of what's happening with the wind because of all the distractions around you. But when you fast, the idea isn't just to say that because I'm denying myself food, I will be more connected with God. No, the denial of food opens up for you the meal times that you're skipping in order to spend them with God. Solitude, having a safe, quiet place where you can be there without distraction to hear his voice. Sabbath, taking a day to clear your schedule of everything you would normally do and do the things that connect you to God, which could be Bible reading, but it could be gardening. <clears throat> it could be doing crafts, but taking a day away just to spend time with God. We need to learn how to be the people of God before we re-engage with doing the stuff the people of God do because our doing needs to flow out of our being. May God bless us by filling our sails with the wind of his spirit and letting us experience the joy and exhilaration of sailing in the faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise as we go to the throne of grace in prayer. Let us pray for the church here and around the world and for all the people in their various circumstances. For the church around the world, all people who join Peter in professing that Jesus is the Christ, that they trust God's purpose for their lives, take their crosses and follow. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who spend their lives serving the physical, mental, social, and emotional needs of the people around them, that God bless and guide them according to his gracious purpose. Let us pray to the Lord. For professional counselors and private confidants who alleviate suffering, enable encouragement, endurance, support character, and encourage hope, that they serve as conduits of God's purposes in the lives of their patients, family, and friends, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who lead the governments of the world, that they find purpose in their position, using every means to increase harvests, combat global health crises, minimize conflict between nations, and ensure equal justice for all their citizens, let us pray to the Lord. <coughs> Lord, for those near and dear to us who need your healing mercies, remembering Karen, Andrew, Barbara, Brian, Jimmy, Audrey, Ray, June, Lee, Darlene, Bill, Jean, Jerry, Anna, Danielle, Charlene, Steve, Anthony, Blake, Roger, Lily, Matt, Annette, Glenn, Ellen, Mai, Richard, Mary, Doug, Kathy, uh, Falana, Hank, Lily, Lillian, John. And for those who mourn the loss of loved ones, Lord, speak the words of gospel peace and hope to the Delvis family, friends of the Marchands, as you called Elaine to her eternal rest in your arms. That God bring about the healing, comfort, freedom, and, and dignity for which they send requests to our gracious Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. These and any other things you would have us to ask you, Heavenly Father, grant to us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom <coughs> and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those here, there are offering plates in the back which you can use to uh, leave your gifts and offerings. To those of you uh, worshiping online this morning, uh, welcome. And there are options uh, on your screen there that you can take advantage of in order to support not only the ministries of Emmanuel, but when you give to Emmanuel, 10% uh, of your gifts flow out to all of our mission partners. Um, so you really will support about 15 ministries with your gifts as you give this morning. Receive the Lord's rich blessing. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our departing hymn, Come Follow Me, the Savior Spake.
few things to be aware of as you go. Please take the news and notes with you. There's lots more information than this in there. Uh, there are still some sackcloth and ashes pins in the back you can take to wear during Lent um, to mark yourself as one who's on the repentant journey. Our Lenten midweek dramas will continue this week with uh, Herod Antipas and Jesus, uh, and we'll see that relationship. There's some interesting historical uh, tidbits in there for you. Um, on Ugh. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock is our ministry clarity meeting. If you'd like more information about what it is that we're getting into uh, and, and uh, what, what all is involved in this process, it's, it's a pretty extensive process in helping us better understand where God is leading us into the future. Uh, that'll be tomorrow night in the fellowship hall at 7 o'clock. We'll also email out a Zoom link uh, so that you can be a part of that. If you can't come in person, uh, join us online for that conversation. We'll record it as well so you can watch it later if you would like. Uh, finally, on the list uh, is a special study on Friday, uh, March 12 and 19 at 6.30. So Pastor Chris's regular Friday evening class, uh, our own theology student here, Justin Clavette, is going to be teaching a study on uh, sexual ethics in the Bible. Uh, we're now in an age where there's lots of different ideas and opinions uh, and even lots of different things thrown out about what the Bible teaches. He's going to help us better understand what God actually says and why he says it. So if you're interested in that conversation, uh, there's more information in your news and notes. Uh, I've tweaked the sending uh, statement that we make, so I invite you to, to open to the last page there uh, as we go forth in grace, peace, and love. We are going deeper in faith, sharing his love in community.